Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dhamma, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbiztechvilly.com. Yeah, Rabbi, you know, we always like law enforcement officials to come in and be on the show and give us the perspective, whether it's Rensselaer County, Saratoga, Albany County. Well, we have a return visit from our district attorney in Albany County, David Soares. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having really me. really appreciate pleasure. that. Excellent. It's good to see you. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was in, happened to be in my home borough of Brooklyn <laughs> and uh, for, in Coney Island, and I heard that Ken Thompson, have you met Ken Thompson? Yes. Okay, he's uh, first mm -hmm. African American yeah, district attorney of Kings right. County in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and he, um, he had this uh, town hall style meeting at a high school in Brooklyn, in Coney Island. Now, I went in feeling great, you know, no problem. But he went ahead and said, we got this number of murders and we're the third busiest DA office in the country behind Chicago and LA. You know, we have this number of major crimes, this number of sex crimes, this number. Of I walked out of there, I'm like, I don't know if I want to be here, you know. <laughs> What's going on? Where's my Brooklyn, you know? So how does Albany County compare to Brooklyn? Is it a microcosm? I always say Albany is, you know, has the arts that New York City has on a smaller scale. We got the crime that New York City has on a smaller scale. We have the education that New York City has on a smaller scale. We have everything New York City has only on a smaller scale. So I was just wondering how that would compare. It's only because last week, I, just recently, I went to uh, this town hall meeting, so that's why I'm bringing it up. Well, you know, the reality is, is that uh, is that I think every community has its challenges, and it has its you know public safety challenges, and um, the, the, to me, I I judge uh, a, a community not on the volume of cases and, and, and issues, but it's their reaction to those cases and what they do um, in addition to reacting to them, but what they do to get ahead. Of those things. Um, certainly D.A. Thompson uh, has a challenge ahead of him. Um, it, we're talking about a much you know larger community with two and a half million people. E exactly compared to our 300,000 uh, and and you have uh, and you're talking about you know conducting business in a community that you have more strangers coming through uh, than most and so while he does have his challenges I also think that he has great opportunity bringing in new people, new leadership in, in various positions uh, to be able to, to move forward and, and conquer a lot. And of he has a challenges. much larger staff than you do. He certainly, he certainly <laughs> does. Now you have what, 30 uh, lawyers? Uh, we, we, we do the work that we do with a total number of about 60 people. That's counting attorneys, that's right. counting support staff, investigators. Right, so attorney, and we, attorneys and investigators, you have 30? Uh, 38, 38 lawyers okay. uh, and about a soon to be about uh, 10 uh, investigators. investigators with, uh, with uh, uh, support staff. Support involved. staff in addition to yeah. that. So the investigators in, are in addition to a detective. You see, again, they're just throw out there's a crime in Albany. And, um, you know, I mean, what's the mechanism? Like, who's going to investigate it? The, the Albany Police Department, and then when do you take over? We have a, you know, what I can say about our relationship with local law enforcement is that uh, it has gotten so much better uh, over the last uh, 10 years. As you can probably <laughs> recall, when yeah. I first came into office, things were a little, uh, there was a lack of trust there. And, and, and I think that what we've been able to do over the last decade is um, overcome a lot of those issues with success and, and introducing new strategies and new ways of doing business. Like, for example, your local law enforcement, they can go ahead and, and make an arrest based upon probable cause, which is a very small uh, a lower, much lower standard than the burden that's imposed upon prosecutors to prove cases beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we really uh, decided to address early on is while you, the arresting officer, may arrest on probable cause, does it make sense to do that if we still lack evidence to establish our burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? So in the past, we've had our local investigators who will do uh, the other grunt work to get more evidence to support a case moving into the mm -hmm. courts. Now we have that kind of relationship at the very beginning. Uh, and, and I would say that some of the most complicated cases that we've been successful with, we've been successful because we have both prosecutors and police working together 
um, along with victims and communities. So now, all of it works. Now in the town courts or city courts, the local courts, they have their local prosecutor and they have a room for the district attorney's office yes. because one handles like uh, speeding tickets and another and your office handles the more violent crimes? You know, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question because I, I do think that people take for granted once they see certain things, they, they never bother to ask those questions. And um, the district attorney's office, we have the authority to prosecute all uh, misdemeanors, all felonies, and even offenses. Um, so in, for example, in Albany County, there's uh, over um, 10,000, you know, offenses that occur every year. Those would be ve vehicular, you know, charges. Mm -hmm. uh, traffic tickets and things like that. What I do is I delegate the authority to prosecute those cases to local town attorneys. So for example in Gilderland, uh, in, in communities like Albany, uh, there will be a town attorney or a city attorney right, that right. will prosecute those lower level offenses. However, we still have our own people in each of those courts that prosecute misdemeanors and uh, are there to address felonies at, at, at their earliest inception. Now I have to tell you, you have a very nice website. It's very friendly, it's very user friendly, you have a very nice website. So uh, we, we say yesha koach to whoever uh, <laughs> put the uh, website together. But it's interesting because you have a listing of all the courts, and there are 17 courts in Albany County, yes. and Rensselaerville Town Court is by appointment only. <laughs> Well, you, you know, and I was like, by appointment, who's going to make an appointment to go to court? You know? Well, you know, what is interesting is that, you know, every court... No one uh, does, no one, nothing happens in Rensselaerville. Well, you, and that's a great thing. I, every court has its each, it has its individual volume. Yeah, I know. Uh, and so, for example, you have courts that, that function every day of the week, like the city of Albany, for example. Yeah. Then you have Colony, which functions two nights a week. And Voorheesville. And Voorheesville. Right. And then you have uh, Water Valley Manans. Right. But then you have some of those other jurisdictions that there's not really the kind of volume, that, and we don't ever want that kind of volume, <laughs> where they may function once a month. Uh, right. And then it's only functioning if there's enough of a, of a calendar for us to be able to get out there <laughs> and, and do that kind of work. But uh, yes, we are thankful for those communities that. Uh, well, the only one that's issues. by appointment only is Rensselaerville. Yeah. I mean, even Knox and Byrne have regular. They have their share. They have they, their share. You know. <laughs> And you know, well, that, that's the other thing, too, because every community, every community is presented yeah. with its own unique set of challenges. You know, uh, while I think that we will we'll often hear about uh, violence involving illegal firearms in urban centers, you know, we do have uh, a lot of alcohol-related offenses in some of the more, our, our suburban communities. So every community presents its own unique set of, of challenges. And judges on these villages and towns could be farmers. They don't have to be... Uh, familiar with the law necessarily. Yes, yes. and and that again, uh, um, it's it that is unique to uh, New York State. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and for practitioners who are coming from from foreign jurisdictions who come here and, and encounter that, they're always shocked. Um, but it works out very well for it the does. most part because it, it, it does. And and uh, we we seem to be very fortunate here uh, to have individuals who if they're. We have OCA, the Office of Court Administration, and they will provide technical advice for right. those judges. Uh, but we also have a, a unique community here where although uh, it's an adversarial relationship with public defenders or defense attorneys and prosecutors, in courts like that and those communities, it's less adversarial and more collegial because everyone's working towards the same okay. goal, which is to do justice. And you have a special victims unit. Brooklyn has a special victims unit. I asked the woman who heads up the Special Victims Unit, this is a, just a funny question, I just want to make a light point, but is that the, um, I said to her, how close is the Law & Order SVU television program, how close is that to what happens really? in your office? And she says, it's very close. Yeah. And they, they take the, they rip the, the stories are ripped from the headlines. So how close is it? In Albany County, how close is that program? Unless you don't watch it, I don't know. But <laughs> well, no, it's 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 very similar, other than the fact that uh, a lot of things are dramatized for purposes of television. Well, it um, also happens in a contracted like they'll start off on a Monday and the case will end on a Friday, and yeah. that, you know in real life that never happens. So. Yeah, <laughs> um, but it but it's very similar in the sense that there's there's ups and downs. There's a lot of a lot of drama as well as it, you know cases like that and very sensitive cases yeah. uh, should have. 
Um, but I, I think that the, I think that you know a person who works in a, in a unit like that, they have to have a very particular skill set. Of course. And and uh, and the people that Strong we have, stomach. absolutely. Uh, the people that we have working in Albany County are are dedicated public servants, but they they go, you know, uh, above and beyond the call of duty uh, to to do those cases. Because in a special victims unit, you're prosecuting uh, cases that involve domestic violence. You're pr prosecuting sexual offenses. You're mm -hmm. prosecuting cases uh, Elder, against the elderly, right. as well as as animals, uh, mm -hmm. animal abuse cases that you're doing there too, and children. And I think for Every one of those victims, you have to have a particular uh, sensitivity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and specialty to be able to address them. You know, one of the things, like Mark says, we have so many um, uh, police superintendents on, and we've always asked, well, what's your major issue nowadays? And so far, we've had like, what, three, Hero four? Heroin. Heroin mm -hmm. is just without, you know, doubt, they just yeah. say the heroin. I mean, uh, you know, you're not the police officer, you're the prosecutor, but is there any way to... I mean, to uh, do you prosecute it? every heroin case that comes into uh, your We office? absolutely do prosecute those cases, and and I think and that's a very important question. I'm glad you asked it because I think if we look back uh, early '70s, it, where we had the original, you know, epidemic of, of heroin and other drugs, quaaludes and, and stuff, and yeah. quaaludes. Not that I, I know. I, I, and, but <laughs> but what came out of yeah. what came out of that uh, era? Were the Rockefeller drug laws, right. um, and, and I think we we really went overboard in mm -hmm. how, as a community, as a society, how we deal with this issue of, of opiate addiction. And my greatest concern is that right now, in this moment, given given everything that we know about heroin and just how many people are dying from accidental overdose, my fear is that we go back to policy that is really not sensible. Um, I think we have to warn people about how dangerous these opiates mm -hmm. are and, and they're very addictive and you know what's different between now and, and in the early 70s is that now it's the legitimate pharmaceutical industry that has really opened up the gateway to the heroin use. Why do you say? Because of the overprescribing that was taking place uh, w with opiates um, and so you may have been involved in, a, in an automobile accident and were prescribed an opiate to, to reduce the pain. Mm -hmm. um, you were over-prescribed that pain, and now uh, those uh, uh, pills, now you're addicted to those pills, and you're a middle-class suburban person who's never done anything before, not even more than one glass of wine a week, and now you are a full-blown addict. And because we have a, we've done a much better job in terms of government doing monitoring of prescription uh, cases, you know, the doctor who was over-prescribing is now not prescribing to you anymore. And so you're going to the streets to buy that deck of heroin that for $10, you're going to get the same feeling and the same high that that $60 pill was giving you. And so in and this that instance... that happens more than we realize? Oh, it, in this county? It, it is happening. It, it is so troubling, the level with which this has happened. Wow. because. Um, you know, if you remember, you know, the early 70s, the image of that person uh, doing heroin was that, you know, returning vet was that individual the in this, the hippie, With you know, the sticking tie, something tie dyed and the in lights and the lava lamps. And, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's, now it's that professional person who six months ago was involved in some kind of accident, may have had a wisdom tooth removed. It's that child who went to the doctor to have surgery that was prescribed this medication that's now addicted. That is the fundamental difference, and that's the reason why you have such a demand right now for the product. And what, ab and what about that that. the person who doesn't get addicted, stops the medication, and then has the extra medicine left over in the medicine cabinet, and their children find it, or they dispose of it improperly, or whatever, you know? We are from a generation where our parents were always told to lock up the liquor cabinet. Mm. And, and today's generation, it's leave the liquor cabinet open, lock up the medicine cabinet. Mm -hmm. Because it's exactly, as you say, what's happening. Uh, proactively, the U.S. Attorney's Office here locally has a, a great program uh, that, that you know, will call on people to turn in their prescribed medication. Okay. You can, and most pharmaceutical companies and, do it. Uh, and, and the public can just 
takeover, their, their leftover medication that's in that medicine cabinet and, and bring it in. I wouldn't know the first place to call or bring it to. But you can always bring it, you can contact a pharmaceutical uh, CVS or a Rite Aid uh, and they will provide you with the information necessary for you to turn in uh, those okay. pills. But you don't have the info off, off uh, I On my website I would have it okay, uh, good. off the top no, of my head. No, if it's head, on the website yeah. that's good because yeah. you could search for that on the search engine there. Uh, I wanted to just ask you about a question that D.A. Thompson brought up in that that's kind of controversial, it has to do with marijuana. Mm -hmm. And he says that for a first time offender who's caught using marijuana in their home, and they're, you know, he had like 700 cases this year so far of this, and he's not prosecuting that because it's, you know, first time, it's not, you know, and, and he doesn't have time with all the other issues that are going on with major crimes and deaths and murders and all that. So, is that the same? But he says, that, you know, he's not in favor of marijuana use and he's not in favor of, and he will prosecute major marijuana cases, but there is a point of reasonableness. Is that the same way you feel? Is that? Uh... Well, what's interesting is that um, in New York State, you know, anyone who is apprehended uh, for violation uh, of the Article 221 statute, which is all your marijuana statutes, they're entitled to an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal, which means that if they don't do anything again, that case that they were originally arrested mm -hmm. on yeah. w will go away. It'll in be dismissed months. as a matter of law. In six months. In six it's months. ACLD. Yeah. Exactly. I, and what, I, what D.A. Thompson has done is, is that um, he's looking at some of the same classes of cases and he's saying, well, we're not going to even wait the six months. We're, gonna, we're just not going to prosecute them. Um, we're going to have a, a record of mm -hmm. the interaction, but right. we're not going to process it through the courts. Right. Now, do you feel the same way here in Albany County? In Albany County, we have not arrived at, at, at that conclusion because I don't think, I think that the path to that decision came for D.A. Thompson right. as a result of the volume of sure. violent crime that he has, where he's looking at his resources. And although they may seem vast to us being from a smaller community, he's looking at his resources and he's saying, I need to free up these resources in order to get at this issue. Right. Now, what I did when I came in 10 years ago was something very similar in the sense that what I said was, we're going to offer people alternatives to incarceration. We're going to offer more drug treatment if, 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 it's, if it's called for. But on low-level offenses, instead of prosecuting and sending people to jail, we're going to do restorative justice practices, and we'll have the Community Accountability Board you know, look at some of these folks. Well, let me just, let me just tell you. The resources that I've been able to save from those policy decisions, mm -hmm. I've been able to create a financial crimes unit yeah. right, that has people going after those who are ripping off uh, our, our entitlement program, um, people that are engaging in white collar crimes. We've been able to send a lot of people who are embezzling um, money and ripping off people in their, from their trusts and estate issues. We've been able to do a lot of good mm -hmm. with the resources that we've been able to redirect from what I felt was poor policy in terms of our war on drugs to financial crimes. No, I see that. I, I think his decision yeah, yeah. is based entirely on not necessarily his own personal beliefs, but one that deals with economics right. of public safety. And since we're a microcosm, like I said in the beginning of the larger issues over there, he's got, you know, you, you have smaller staff. I see that basically the units are comparable Several yes. of the units are comparable with your office as his. He's got more units than than you do, but certainly the. the well, you talk about alternative drug programs. But I'm wondering if you. But but I'm wondering if you decide. You know, it, is saying alternative drug programs saying no that you don't prosecute? Or? No, that's not that's I'm not. I'm asking. We, I don't yeah, know. No. I'm, I'm trying to. No, the, so you the, do prosecute. We would prosecute. You would prosecute we, even if someone was caught with a small amount of marijuana in their home and it was a first offender. A first offender, small amount of marijuana in their home, I, we would not, first of all, I would love to see the agency that investigated, that put those resources into investigating a case like okay. that. But a case like that, if it's a first time offender, we would offer the adjournment and contemplation and dismissal, okay. which, right. you know, would mechanically work in the okay. same way that, um, that, that D.A. Thompson. Well, okay, good. Well, we had on our TV show that is the first choice. Is there, that's um, the recovery center. Recovery center says connected. he says he gets people from all over. Maybe from your office. As I'm asking, you know, just saying, well, you have a drug problem, pal. 
you know, so instead of incarcerating them in the prison, they're saying you need rehabilitation and using that program. That's exactly what we do. In fact, we have one prosecutor who's dedicated entirely to making sure that um, people who come in presenting with an addiction issue are afforded the opportunity to get treatment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and that's a very important part of, of my administration because, to be quite frank with you, we have to do a better job of qualifying people for prison. Mm -hmm. There are people who you may send in for a very low level offense that may come out worse and, and endanger the public more when they come out. And mm -hmm. so it's not about immediate gratification. It's about long-term public safety policies that benefit everyone in every community. Just on a brief note, I mean, I had a couple of friends, unfortunately, who were in the county jail, but they came out saying that other prisoners were planning their next crime when they were going to be released so that they could go back into jail because it's three hots in a cot and it's a secure area and that they, you know, they feel better. And this guy who uh, was involved with that uh, woman in on Waterloo Shaker Road that recently where he got off the bus or she oh, got off yes, the bus. Yes. He followed her. He had just been out of jail the day a couple of days before. Yes. And, it, and I was like, okay, well, this is what my what a couple of people I know have told me. You know. <laughs> well, see, and I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that the average person, I think we all have to think about public safety in a in a greater context, right? It's not just, can I walk down this street tonight? Mm -hmm. It's, how are we doing with our jails? Are, do we have you know, programs going on in jail where, where people are being educated? Um, and, and I know that's not an easy thing for the average taxpayer, especially with all the burden that the taxpayers are carrying today. The idea of going to jail and getting educated is just not something that's politically appealing. However, you have to think about the long term. Mm -hmm. And long term means, yeah, they're going in, but they're coming out. And we want to make sure that when they come out, they're better than when they had gone in. And so I, I question uh, how you achieve that if we're not making investments in the penitentiary system. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of discussion about the overuse of, of jails right now uh, and you know, perhaps decriminalizing. And I think there's a lot of uh, academic debate about that. And, and I, I always say, well, you know, I, I don't have the luxury of an opinion. I have the burden of proof. That's right. Um, That's and so, right. you know, as a society, I think we have to come together and we have to think about public safety, but we have to broaden the context in which these conversations are had. I, I just want to go back. The Financial Crimes Unit, you have something called CARP, yes. C-A-R-P, which is Crimes Against Revenue Program. Mm -hmm. And you have the slogan, Pennywise, Pound Foolish. And then SALT is an acronym for? Seniors and law enforcement together. Okay. One, one of the things that we realized uh, is that whenever a, s a member of our senior community is victimized, there's a whole host of embarrassment that comes along with that. They, they don't want to reach out to police because <laughs> They don't want the attention that the bright lights and the man in uniform with a loud radio brings to their door. And they also don't want to feel foolish because they've been victimized. And one of the things that we try to do with our outreach is, is go to the senior community and say, listen, the guy who conned you, he's a professional. He could have conned anybody. Mm -hmm. So don't allow for that shame to make you not reach out to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to, to be there for you and you can reach out to us directly without having to go through all of those processes. Okay. And what we'll do is when you reach out to us, we'll have a prosecutor, an investigator, and an advocate come out wherever you want in them a, to. In an unmarked car. In an unmarked car. <laughs> no lights. In a, in a, we'll meet you at a diner. Okay. We'll meet you, you know, at, at, a, at a, a town hall. We'll meet right. you at a library. But wherever it is that we go, you will have the confidence that we will not, you know, draw more attention to you. That's and great. we'll fight vigorously to hold that offender accountable, regain your property if we can, uh, and not have that light and a stigma attached. Now, you, you, I, I know that you really like um, these uh, slogans. You're a slogan guy. <laughs> and uh, just like, you know, CARP, like Crimes Against Revenue Program. Yeah. You also have the bullying, pro, anti-bullying program, not a bullying program, it's an anti-bullying program. We want to <laughs> stop it. <laughs> our words determine our thinking, and our thinking controls our actions, and our actions define our character. How will you s use your words today? And, yeah. I, you know, it just goes on where you have the rap sheet newsletter, 
and Fighting Crime, Building Hope, which is that big billboard on, uh, what was it, the end of New Scotland Avenue yes. by Madison, and words, words Hurt programs. or Heal. No, that's for Brooklyn. Them. Brooklyn does oh, that. Brooklyn that's does from Brooklyn. Also, they have a no me. bullying zone, they have a no gang zone. Yep. And I thought maybe, you know, we don't need that, I guess. We, we already, we don't have enough of it where we need a zone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know it, but what you I want to talk about bullying and, and you have a program that we select the winner and words is an acronym. Yeah. Or, you know, what so. we wanted to do was create a, an anti-bullying program that really didn't, we wanted to simplify things and, and to get people to really focus on the fact that bullying is really about words, right? It's your word choice. Mm -hmm. And words have power, words have meaning. And so mm -hmm. you can really impact the way that a person feels by the words that you choose. And so we wanted to create a program that empowered children, and empowered youth, and empowered everyone. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to end bullying, you do. Mm -hmm. Now, as a government agency, as a powerful office, you know, even with all of our power, we don't have the ability to end bullying because it happens on a daily basis but we wanted to create a program that reached out to youth that empowered youth to go ahead and and put their words into action and we know that kids today use all sorts of different media they use Facebook they use Instagram they use all sorts of so what we wanted to do is we challenged the youth of Albany County to put your words into action and do a random act of kindness mm -hmm. share it with us send it via Instagram or, or Facebook, send it to our website and every week we're going to choose a winner. That winner receives a, 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 a t -shirt. backpack, a mm. t-shirt, a water bottle. But then that winner has the opportunity at the end of every month, if that winner can muster the support from their friends and family, to vote on our website for a monthly winner. And the monthly winner would get uh, what we call an Apple technology suite. They would win an iPad, and they would win uh, he uh, Beats headphones, uh, which are very popular. And I'm presuming the cost of this is minimal because a lot of it maybe gets donated or something? We have right? donations, but we also, what we do is uh, we, we do Robin Hood programs uh -huh. where we take money from the criminals and right. then we, we invest it back into community. Kind so of, yeah, okay. Kind of like what uh, the Attorney General did with the vests, with the bulletproof vests. He took money from, I guess, the drug money and he bought bulletproof vests for police officers. Well, I don't know um, which attorney general you're talking about, but if, uh, if, if it's that kind of investment, then I'm sure he borrowed it from a, a guy in Albany who, yeah. uh, <laughs> for the last 10 years, I've been, for the last 10 years, you know, we believe so. wholeheartedly that, uh, that criminals should never hang on to the money that they get illegally. Right. Uh, but we take those dollars and we try to put it back into some of the most positive things in, in those neighborhoods. And, uh, buying vests for uh, police officers, guns for police officers. We buy vests for our dogs, uh, our, our uh, police dogs, mm -hmm. because they too are in the line of fire. Um, but we invest in youth-related programs and we invest in senior-related programs as well. Well, I'll tell you, time is flying by. We only have a few more minutes, but I wanted to just quickly say, in your DA's office, you have an investigations unit, community justice outreach center, major crimes unit, vehicular crimes unit, public integrity unit, street crimes unit, crime victims unit, the special victims unit, appeals and legal affairs unit. I mean, so you, you know, you have basically uh, Keep you mirrored. Busy. Well, you you don't like in Brooklyn they have a sex trafficking unit. I don't see that human trafficking unit. They have a homicide division. I don't know if you have a homicide or we where, have a, where that would fall in. We, but. We, we, what we don't do, because we do not have the number of bodies right. um, that we could, what we believe is in, is in specialization. Every kind of crime comes with a unique set of uh, forensic knowledge that one must possess, uh, comes with some unique case law that, that a, an attorney must possess. Mm -hmm. What we've done is we've gone away from what used to be called a lateral prosecution, we've gone to a vertical style of prosecution where if a case comes into the court today, chances are that the prosecutor who's assigned to that case is the prosecutor that's going to take that case from the door all the way to conviction. Mm -hmm. And so it gives that prosecutor the opportunity to familiarize themselves with all the facts with the kind of law that is specific to that case. If they stay in employed. With if you. they stay employed, which, uh, <laughs> you know, which many which of them. You, uh, you don't have a high turnover rate. In we do not office. have no. a high turnover rate, so, but we have our challenges. Well, quickly, one last thing is the, um, 
Badge of Honor Hall of Fame, and there's 11 members there now. I mean, is that again a, a cute, you know, slogan type thing that? Well, you're, it's not really to inspire people and make more po make it more positive and break down barriers with the. I think I DA's think that office. there are people who go to work every day, and especially our men and women in uniform. And you know what we try to do is identify people who go above and beyond the call of duty, and they're not expecting it. There's no one competing for these acknowledgments, uh, but when you see great work and that great work results in a victim who is, is satisfied, who is on the path to, um, to recovery, is on the path to, to a better quality of life, you have to look at that and say, man, you know, I'm proud of what you've done. And in, it's a small token, it's a small, it's a small acknowledgement, but it's something for you to hang on your wall and, and to realize that in that moment in time that you were the best person for this case, for this victim, and we want to acknowledge you for that. Okay, well, thank you for the time. Thank I you. Really uh, thank you again that uh, we always enjoy having you because there's always something important that I think not only we, I surely learned, but the public is learning about the DA's office. So continue the good work. I affectionately give you a Hebrew name, uh, David, and uh, David, I know. <laughs> David Saros, and, and continue the good work for the people of Albany County and do it with good health. Yes, thank All you so best. much. Thank you.